up. Blessings come down. With praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why is your heart filled with That's praise? Why. My Has God done anything for you this week? Hallelujah. Now, if he hasn't done anything for you, you don't have to say anything. But if God has done anything for you, you ought to give him praise. Hallelujah. God's been too good to me. Hallelujah. That I can't come to a worship place and just be silent. And that's not to say that you can't worship God in silence. I, I believe that there's an awesome sound to silence. But I also read in the psalm that the redeemed of the Lord ought to say so. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out hallelujah. I sing praise to you, my king. Hallelujah. Sometimes I find myself in my shower, praise God, and I think about so many people who can't shower. I think about people who wear the same clothes every day, don't have the opportunity to bathe or clean up. Some people are living out on the streets. And everybody living on the streets is not there because they made wrong decisions. Some people have just fallen on hard times. <clears throat> or as Derek said, they're between a rock and a hard place. So when we are able to experience the things that we are able to do, we ought to give God immediate praise. Yeah. I thank God for you. I thank God that in a world that seems to be going away from God, that there are people who are striving to worship God and to praise him for who he is. For he is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. And he can answer every prayer that is praying. He may not come when you want him, but when he shows up, he's always on time. Who couldn't serve a God like that? And so we're here this morning, not because we've been so good. Praise God. I, I know we look good, we're dressed up, and you know, our Sunday attire, but if the truth be told, we've all come through struggles and stresses. With whatever faith we have, we need God to increase our faith. Amen. To take us from faith to faith. Because yesterday's triumphs don't guarantee successes, victories. But I heard somebody say, each victory will help you some others to win. And so today, don't miss the opportunity to praise God. 
Don't miss the opportunity to lift up your hands and tell God thank you. Don't, don't allow a rock to cry out for you. A rock is an inanimate object. Amen. But you and I, we know what brought us through. Amen. I don't know about you, but I got a posse following me. Amen. I heard David say, surely, goodness and mercy, they follow me all the days of my life. One of these days, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. So we're here today because God is good. We're here today to worship and praise our God. And it, it is not lost upon me that we're in the Thanksgiving season. Amen? I don't think you ought to wait till Thanksgiving to give God thanks. Amen? And even on Thanksgiving, you know, people, they seem to worship that turkey more than they worship God. The dressings, all the things that go along with it, praise God. But we need to worship the God who provides. Amen? And so I was pondering what I would preach on today and asking God what would be a relevant and pertinent scripture passage for true light and for those who are joining us on the internet amen and god showed me and took me to back to a passage of scripture amen that's found in luke the seventh chapter Starting at verse 1. <laughs> Amen. And so with your Bibles in your hand, praise God, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 7, praise God, verses 1 through 10. And we thank God for our musicians Amen. Who bless us with their gifts. Amen. Amen. We don't take that for granted, but we thank God. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 7 is a very familiar passage of scripture. It says, now when he concluded all his sayings, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say in a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith 
not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to our God. You may be seated in the presence of our God. I thought about changing my subject, but it's just such a great subject until I just thought I would just keep it. Amen. I want to talk to you from the subject, faith that made Jesus marvel. Faith that made Jesus marvel. And I thought this would be a an appropriate passage of scripture in the Thanksgiving season because if we want to give God thanks, if we want to give God honor for what he has done in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones and friends, we need to do things that God can say, wow. That God can take pleasure in. Amen? And so when I saw this passage of scripture, I thought about the fact that Jesus could not do any great works in Nazareth. You know why? Because the people in Nazareth, and Nazareth was where he grew up, they thought they knew him. They thought that he was just Another boy. Amen. They had become too familiar with Jesus. You know, people are like that, aren't they? When people think they know you, sometimes it's difficult to show what God can do through you because folks think they know you so well. Sometimes you cannot do the things that God really wants you to do until you leave from around familiar company. Amen. Sometimes even in your family, people don't think that you are capable of just so much. Can I tell you about human uh, reality? People will deal with you positively possibly as long as you're not ahead of them. Amen. As long as you are on their level or lower, they're all right with you. But if you dare to allow God to take you higher, see, that's my prayer all the time. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm not satisfied being where I am. I want to be higher. I want to go as high, God, as you want to take me. But everybody can't deal with that. Amen. Everybody can't deal with the fact that you allow yourself to be used by God. Amen. And they don't understand that what God does for one, he'll do for you. But you've got to avail yourself to God. Amen. So God, Jesus could not do great works in Nazareth because they, they said, that boy, you know, that's, that's that boy. Don't nobody who his daddy is. You know, when you live in a small town, like Canton, when everybody think they know everybody else's business, you know, that's, 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 that's Sarah's boy. And so Jesus could not do any great works because of their unbelief. But Jesus is not in Nazareth in our text. He's in Capernaum. And in Capernaum, they brought their sick to Jesus and Jesus made them whole. 
They brought people who were perplexed with all kinds of issues and diseases. And the Bible said that Jesus was able to do great works. Why? Because in Capernaum, they believed that Jesus was who he said he is. They believed that Jesus is the son of almighty God. And I just dare you to trust God. Matter of fact, I double dog dare you to put your faith and confidence in a God who can't fail. And God will do extraordinary things even for you. Amen? While he was in Capernaum, he met a centurion, a, a, a man who was under Roman authority. Caesar was his boss. Amen. He didn't grow up in Jewish tradition. He, he, he possibly did not know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, he did not have in his background the Psalms and all of the psalmists. You, you know, when you, when you have things in your background that you can pull from, a reservoir, it can help you on the journey. Amen. Like he, he could read if he was in Jewish tradition, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If he was in Jewish tradition, he could read that, that the Lord is my rock and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? All of that was in the tradition of the Jews, but this man was not a Jew. He was a Roman centurion. He was under authority. And I wondered why this passage was so important to be included in the Bible. And it dawned upon me that this centurion was just a common man. He was, he was a soldier, but he didn't have advantages of other people. He didn't, he didn't go to Sunday school. Praise God. He, didn't, he wasn't a part of the First Baptist Church of Capernaum. Amen. He didn't, he, he didn't have that in his repertoire. The Bible simply says he was a Roman centurion. But he had a sick servant oh my goodness and he sent word to Jesus now the question should be asked why would a Roman centurion send word to Jesus you all do know that the Romans ultimately were going to put Jesus on a cross and crucify him you, you, you all do know that it was Pilate that when Jesus was standing in front of him, he said, what is truth? And he didn't know that he was looking at truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It was the Romans who were in control of Jewish community. A puppet government had been set up. And yet this Roman centurion, sends word to Jesus and says, I need you to stop by my house because I got a sick servant. Now implicit in his plea was, I believe you can do something. Why would a centurion believe that Jesus could answer his problem? I'm glad you asked. Because he had seen and observed Jesus operating in and around Capernaum. Evidently, he had seen either firsthand or secondhand God's ability to do what needed to be done. And so he reached out to Jesus and said, if you just come by my house, 
I believe that you can heal my sick servant. Would to God that people today would, would ask Jesus to come by their house. You know, I, I believe that houses and homes would be much better today if people would just invite Jesus to come to the house. Amen. And, you know, instead of inviting, you know, everybody else and, you know, you got the same stuff going on all the time, why not invite Jesus? If you invite Jesus, you might stop having break-ins. You might have breakouts. If you invite Jesus, Jesus can put love in every room, peace, contentment in every room. If, if you invite Jesus to your house, you won't have to wait until Sunday morning to get a prayer through. But you can pray wherever you are. Hallelujah. If you invite Jesus to stop by your house, don't put him out. Amen. If Jesus want to stay, he said, if, if you uh, uh, open the door, I will sup with you and you with me. In other words, Jesus don't want to be just a visitor. He wants to become a permanent resident. I didn't even think this. This is coming off hot off the press right here. Have you ever had anybody to come over to your house and you invite them? Maybe they were on hard times or they were going through and you invited them to stay a few days in your house? Anybody? Have you ever had anybody come by your house and they say, you know, I just need, you know, a week or two. <laughs> and a week turned into a month. And a month turned into two. And pretty soon you start to think that they thought that this was their permanent resident. You don't have to tell me. Because you know, some of y'all got, got relatives. <laughs> Come by the house, eat up everything. Don't do nothing. No, they just eat and sleep. And, and after a while, you be wanting to put them out. Hey man, y'all you, you don't, don't have to tell me, I know. You want to put them out because they, they, they are drag on your, you doing you. And you know, when you got somebody in the house and they, they're not permanent residents, you can't act the way you want to act. Amen. Russ, you can't, you, you can't let loose. He invited Jesus to come to the house. A Roman centurion. He did not have what we would think a person needed to have in order for Jesus to come by. Can I tell you something? Jesus will come to your house irregardless of what your bank account is. Amen. I'm glad he'll come to my house irregardless of my bank account because I ain't alone. Some of y'all, if you miss one paycheck, Okay, two. If you miss two paychecks, you, you are in trouble. Amen. Some of y'all, you don't have one credit card. You got 10. And all you can do is pay the minimum. And the interest is making it bigger than your purchase. And so you're living from paycheck to paycheck just to pay the bills. 
because you need to invite Jesus in the house. Now, I need to tell you, if you invite Jesus in the house, you might need some scissors. See, y'all, see, everybody don't want Jesus to come by because, you know, Jesus may have you cut up some of them cards. Hello, somebody. If Jesus come in, you know, you know when, when you have somebody of, of, of great authority that come to your house, if, if no, that's a bad example. But if, if, if there was a, a politician that wanted to stop by your house, you would try to clean up, right? But Jesus, if he comes by, he's going to make sure that it's not just your cleanup, but Jesus is going to deal with your attic. He going to come and he going to deal with everything that's out of order. And even them little secrets you got. He want to deal with all of it. And then, you know, if we were honest, if people were honest when they came to church, if they would just wear what they need, You know, over your suit and your dress, you know, just I'm a liar. First of all, we would know not to tell you any secrets. But then the other thing is we could pray that lying demon off of you so you could take Jesus home with you. And whatever you're, you're dealing with, that's what Jesus wants to deal with you. You know, Jesus... Jesus don't want to do, deal with just what you do. He want to do, deal with what you don't do. So everybody don't want to invite Jesus. They just want to come by on a Sunday and wave their hand and say good platitudes and then leave Jesus where he is. Christmas is coming. Some people are looking at Christmas and Thanksgiving haven't even got here. You know what they do on Christmas? They take Jesus out of the box. Because he's packed in somebody's basement right now. And people like a baby Jesus. Because you can do, you can manipulate a baby. Man, you got to take a, you got to pick a baby up, carry it where it needs to go, you got to, you know, and, and that's what kind of Jesus a lot of people want, Tomir. A Jesus that they can handle. But Jesus is not a baby anymore. And when you invite him to come to your house, he don't want to just lay on your coffee table in a manger. Jesus want to deal with you. So everybody ain't too kosher about inviting Jesus to their house. I'm still in my text because the centurion invited Jesus to his house. Amen? Because he had a sick servant and he believed that Jesus was able to do what he said he could do. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus can do everything but fail? Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait. See, I should have warned you not to, not to answer so fast. Because if you believe that, then when things break out in your house, instead of running, trying to find answers elsewhere, you would understand that Jesus has made you a priest. And since you are the priest of your house, you have the ability to tell Jesus what you need and you believe that Jesus will put in order what's out of order. You, you, if you really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, you know that Jesus is not going to put up with just anything and everything. That he's in the business of making a way out of no way. Praise God. I believe that if you got an illness in your body, you shouldn't have to wait until Sunday 
for the preacher to lay his hands on you. If you're a priest, lay hands on yourself. Ask God to come and, 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 and keep on asking him. He may not come when you want him, but when he shows up, See, in order to invite Jesus to your house, you got to have faith. What is faith? Faith, the F in faith stands for forsaking. The A in faith stands for all. The I in faith stands for I. The T in faith stands for trust. And the H in faith stands for him. You put it all together, faith is forsaking all. I trust him. Forsaking all. I trust him. Now I need to tell you that if you are a person of faith, it doesn't exempt you from fear. Amen. To be human is to have fear. I know God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind, but we don't get everything from God. I mean, some things we get from other places, and then some things we heap on ourselves. Amen. It didn't come from God, but it's operating in you. What is fear? Well, the F in faith stands, or fear stands for false. The E stands for evidence. The A stands for appearing. And the R stands for real. Fear is false evidence appearing real. So when fear knocks on your door, if you're a person of faith, you let faith answer the door. Because forsaking all I trust in knows how to deal with false evidence appearing real. Yeah. So this centurion asked Jesus to come to the house. Now, Jesus knows everybody. Amen? Jesus knew he was a centurion, knew he was not a part of the Jewish tradition, and possibly the Jews that were in that house understood that, and so they went out and said, Jesus, the person that's asking you to come, he's worthy. Now, that's saying a lot about a Gentile. That's saying a lot about a centurion. That's saying a lot about somebody who was not steeped in Jewish tradition. They said to Jesus, he's worthy. Why? Because he built us a synagogue so we could worship in. He's a good man. He, he tries to take care of people of faith. You know, it's good to have a good reputation. And your reputation can take you a lot of places money can't take you. Hey man, if you got a good reputation, uh, uh, sometimes your reputation can open doors that other things can't. Or I'll tell you this, sometimes you may not have a good reputation, but your daddy do, or your mama does. And sometimes just because your parents have faith, a person will take a chance on you. Say, well, you know, you come from good stock, so I'm going to take a chance on you predicated on the faith of your parents. Yes. Yes. It's good to have a good reputation. They said this man, this centurion, he's a good man. He, he helps us. He's built us a synagogue, and he's worthy for you, Jesus, to come to his house. Right. And you know what Jesus did? He started walking towards the man's house. And the centurion sent messengers out to Jesus and said, Jesus, you don't even have to come to the house. Because I'm a man under authority. I tell one man to go there and he goes there. I tell another to do this and he does that. In other words, I, my house may not be as clean for you to come I, I'm a man under authority, but if you just speak the word, if you just say the word, 
Good God Almighty, I stopped by here on my way to heaven to tell you we need more Christians who have a speak the word faith. Hallelujah. And Lord, you don't even have to come by the house if you just say the word. At your word, demons tremble. At your word, mountains get out of the way. At your word, winds bow down. Waves obey your will. Lord, you don't even have to come to the house. Just say the word. Just speak the word. Because there's power in your word. There's salvation in your word. There is deliverance in your Say the word. This is a centurion. He's not no Christian. He's not somebody that went to Sunday school. He's just a centurion. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God's power is not predicated on what you have. God's power is predicated on who he is. Yes, yes, yes. And so Jesus didn't, he didn't go to the house. He just spoke the word. He just said the word. And so when they got back to the house, they, they found that the servant was healed. So they inquired as to when he got healed. And they found out that it was when Jesus said the word. He just spoke the word and everything was all right. I, I wish somebody in the house would just tell Jesus if you just say the word. This Sunday morning, I, 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 I've been wrestling with some things. I've been going through some stuff and folk been on my nerves and I feel like cussing them out. But if you just say the word, I go to work, I try to do the right thing, and their co-workers who just, they know how to push the right buttons, and they, they're on my last nerve. If you just, to just speak the word, I, I believe that, that, that it, my situation and my circumstance will improve. Just say the word. That's kind of faith I want. I want to speak the word faith. Amen. Lord, just, just do you. Hallelujah. Just say the word. And I know everything will be all right. Faith makes us active in God's work. Do you all know that, that faith will do what other things can't do? Faith and, and another thing faith does, it makes us humble. I'm going to say this. I'm almost finished. Faith makes us humble. Because we all think we got a lot of stuff going on for us. If you got a few thousand dollars in the bank, you think your money is keeping you. But let the banks mess up again. You think that people will help you, but people will help you as long as they think you got something. See, I didn't even want to go down this street, but have you ever, when you had a car, you helped folk, you gave folk a ride, and then when you got without, you couldn't find nobody? Long as you had money, it was, you had money. Sometimes in your life, you may have had so much money that your pockets looked like you got the mumps. And folk could hang out with you as long as they think you got some money. But when your money get funny, all of a sudden things change. Hallelujah. Faith makes us humble because faith makes us understand that Lord, if you don't do something, I'm not going to make it. We've been talking in the Sunday school lesson about the children of Israel. Children of Israel 
were at the Red Sea. At the Red Sea. Red Sea is in front of them. There are mountains on either side of them. And Pharaoh had a change of mind. And he's in hot pursuit of them. And they didn't get out there because they believed in God. They were following Moses. And they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We could have stayed in Egypt and died. We, we could have had good burial places in Egypt. And we, here we are out here, you know, and got us all excited. Brought us out here to die. Why did you mess with us, Moses? And they had a business meeting. And they decided they were going to stone Moses. Read the text. It's in there. And you know what Moses did? Because Moses was a person of faith. You know what he did? He prayed. Because sometimes that's all you can do is just pray. And he prayed to God. And you know, God, <laughs> this is what I love about God, Jerry. God already has given you the answer. Amen. God don't have to go find your answer. God has already placed your answer in your way. And so when Moses prayed, can you imagine what Moses' prayer was like? God, they, they were going to stone me. I told you I wasn't able to do all of this. Now here I'm out here, they want to, they done had a business meeting, I'm in trouble. And you know what God said to him? He said, what did I give you? Well, see, you gave me a stick. He said, well, stick it to him. <laughs> Those are notes by Gary Martin. <laughs> but I know it's true because guess what he did? He raised the stick. And guess what happened? The winds had a conference. The Red Sea opened up like a scroll. And Israel walked across dry shot because God delivered. Now you would think that all of them Israelites would have been saved because they saw the Red Sea open. They experienced God's delivering power. How many of you all know that we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith? Because if they had faith, they would not have died in the wilderness. Everybody that went through that Red Sea that was 20 years of age or older, they had their funeral in the wilderness, except two. And guess what got the two through? Faith. They had the faith that made Jesus marvel. And they were able to go to the promised land. Now, you and I, reading the text, have a tendency to say, you know what, if I had been there, Russell, if I had seen the Red Sea open, Yolanda, if I had just seen that and walked through water, you know where in the world I would have been lost. <laughs> we say that, don't we? Because we have a tendency to think that the people in the Bible are different than us. They just like us. What has God shown you? What have you seen God do? I'm gonna throw this in free just cause y'all here. Jesus told them you are gonna do greater works than I did. And some of y'all don't even know what the greater works are. Greater works. You, greater works than you did, Jesus? <laughs> so 
So this is what I'm about to do. I'm about to get on a jet plane. I'm going to fly to Atlanta. Then I'm going to get on another plane. And that plane is going to go straight shot from Atlanta to Johannesburg, South Africa. Nonstop. That's like 15 plus hour flight. Jesus couldn't get on no plane. Matter of fact, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. Did y'all know that? Yeah, Jesus couldn't. Have, Jesus did. He, you and I can get on a plane. We can be in, in New York one hour and in four or five hours be in Los Angeles. We can go over. Y'all got computers in your hand. You call them cell phones. You can talk to anybody in the world. Y'all take selfies. <laughs> and whereas you used to have a Polaroid that had to spit out the picture and you watched it develop, now you get them instantly on your cell phone. You can even put them on Facebook. You got all of this going on and you can't see the greater works. You go to the hospital now, it don't matter what kind of surgery you have, you're getting up and out in a few days. Amen. Because they have what they call laser surgery now. You don't bleed as much. They don't have to cut you as hard. They do things to you that, that put people in prison for doing outside. You walk out and somebody cut you, they go to jail. But you pay somebody to cut you, they cut you, stitch you up, and then the next day they got you up walking. And depending on your insurance, or not, <laughs> but I believe if we're going to give God glory this Thanksgiving season, we need to have the faith that makes Jesus marvel. We ought to have the kind of faith where Jesus got to pause and say, wow, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. That centurion had so much faith until Jesus even looked at the disciples and said, he got more faith and he's a Roman centurion. What's your excuse today? Some of y'all been in church so long until <laughs> you've been in church so long until you thank God for state press pants and the dresses. <laughs> Been y'all been the BTU, ATU, FSU, all kind of U's. Y'all don't know what that is, do you? Afternoon services. Some of y'all, but how many of y'all when you were coming up, you stayed in church? Raise your hand. You you left for Sunday school and you didn't get back home until the sun went down. And with all of that. You still need the Lord. You still got to have faith to make it. Do you have the faith that it made Jesus marvel? I think that's what we ought to ask God for for Thanksgiving. Lord, I know we're going to have a good time. We're going to have turkey and dressing and all of the fixings. And we're going to enjoy family and friends. But God, this Thanksgiving. What I want more than anything else is a faith that makes you marvel. Everybody on your feet.
Every time you hear a sermon, it calls for a response. What are you going to do? What kind of faith do you have? And if you got faith, you need more faith. God wants to take you from faith to faith because you all know we believe, but we need the Lord to help our unbelief. And so this morning, or this afternoon, you need to ask God, God, show me the areas in my life that need improving. God, I, I have faith, but I need more faith. And so God, I invite you to come to my house. And God, I don't want you to leave. I want you to take up residence in my house. Because I believe that if you just say the word, that everything will be all right. And I need to be able to tell my friends and family and even my adversaries that there is power in your word. So God, right now, for that person who don't know you, who needs to get to know you, God, touch their heart. Give them a saving faith to come to you. For that person who may be struggling, going through, help them to understand that you have the power to just speak and your word can change circumstances. God, whatever the need, you supply it. And God, we're just going to thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The door of the church is open. You can come. If you don't have a church home, this is a great place to be. Wherever you are, if you just step out, there are people at the doors. You just go to them. They'll let you know what you need to do. Amen. But God is speaking to you, and he requires a response from you. What is your response? The door is open. Yes, Lord.